The bulletin covers that we sometimes render for our uh, bulletin Sunday to Sunday are always linked with the scripture that we're focusing on. I think this sign that's on the front is very interesting. Please look at it if you have not observed it. It says, some people are so poor, all they have is money. Comedian Jack Benny, who virtually all of us remember from TV's Golden Age, once had a skit that illustrated uh, how we place money ahead of everything. He was walking down the street when suddenly he was approached by an armed robber. Sticking the gun in his face, the robber said to Benny, your money or your life? There was a long pause. Jack did nothing. The robber impatiently queried, well? And Jack replied, don't rush me. I'm thinking it over. (laughs) We can expand what's being talked about here. It isn't just about money. It's about possessions. It's about things of this world that we value or treasure or build up, as in the case of the parable. So I'd like for us to look at possessions and life and see how they aren't the same thing. The background to our story is an incident that occurred in Galilee as Jesus was teaching a large crowd. A young man called out from the crowd and said, Rabbi, tell my brother to divide the inheritance of our father. Now, Jewish law clearly prescribed at the death of a father that the eldest son would receive two-thirds of the inheritance, while a younger son would receive one-third of the inheritance. So this is obviously the younger son who is complaining about the inherent unfairness of the Jewish law. Nothing will divide brothers and sisters more than dividing up an estate. So it was then and so it is now. Jesus refused to get involved in a family squabble. You notice what he says, friend, who set me to be the judge or arbiter over you? By the way, a little anecdote. Uh, I've noticed some wisdom that uh, some in our midst are are, uh, exercising these days, and that is that they're labeling things and saying, this goes to so-and-so in the family, and this goes to so-and-so. So they're trying to avoid these squabbles that sometimes erupt over who gets what. Jesus was concerned, however, about the greater implications of being preoccupied with the things of this world. He said, beware of greed. For life does not consist in things we possess. The sum total of a person's life is more than their financial portfolio. He illustrated this point, of course, by telling a story. He talks about a man who had what he calls an unbroken run of prosperity. That's what Brett Blair refers to it as. In today's language, he had successfully played the commodities market and had become so prosperous that his barns could not hold all of his crops. His solution was to tear down those barns and build bigger and better ones. Then with his financial security well in hand, he could sit back and truly enjoy life. His philosophy was at this point, eat, drink, and be merry. The truth be told, we hear this story and we find ourselves rather envious of this man who seems financially set. He's successful. He seems to be savvy and wise. Yet Jesus concluded the story by shockingly saying that this man was foolish. The issue before us this morning is this. What did the man do wrong? Why did Jesus call him foolish? To answer the question, we have to understand that this is not a parable about money or possessions. It's a parable about values, about what's really important in life. And with that in mind, we suggest there are four things this man did that made him foolish. And I'm borrowing from an excellent outline of this text that I thought really grabbed its essence by a man named Brett Blair. 
So we start with this. He had full barns, but an empty heart. First, he was a fool because he had those full barns, but what was of eternal value was in his heart. He was rich in man's eyes, but he was poor in God's eyes. The question that we should ask ourselves this morning is, are we rich in God's eyes? St. Jerome, an early Christian leader who wrote in about 400 AD, mentioned a letter that, a godly, that he wrote to a godly woman. And he was commending her because, and here's the phrase he used, she preferred to store her money in the stomachs of the needy rather than in her purse. Let's think about that phrase. She preferred to store her money in the stomachs of the needy rather than in her purse. It's right to make investments as long as we understand that the best investment we can make is in the kingdom of God. The only future that is sure is God's future. God will be with you whether or not the NASDAQ ever gets to a a 5,000 trademark or drops out completely. God will always be there. Leo Tolstoy once wrote a story about a successful peasant farmer who was not satisfied with what he had. He wanted more of everything. How is, here is how Tolstoy tells his story. One day the farmer received a novel offer. For a thousand rubles, he could buy all the land that he could walk around in a single day. The only catch in the deal was that he had to be back at his starting point by sundown. Early the next morning, he started out walking at a very fast pace. By midday, he was tired, but he kept going, covering more and more ground. Well into the afternoon, he realized that his greed had taken him very far from his starting point. He quickened his pace as the sun began to sink slowly into the sky. He began to run, knowing that if he did not make it back by sundown, the opportunity to become an even bigger landowner would then be lost. As the sun began to sink below the horizon, he came within sight of the finish line. Gasping for breath, his heart pounding, he called upon every bit of strength left in his body and staggered across the line just before the sun disappeared. Immediately, however, he collapsed with blood streaming from his mouth. In a few minutes, he was dead. Afterward, his servants dug a grave. It was not much over six feet long and three feet wide. The title of Tolstoy's story was, How Much Land Does a Man Need? Now, it should be noted, we uh, very often do the Russians a disservice. We associate everything with communism. Leo Tolstoy lived in the late days of the great old empire of Russia and the beginnings of communism. He was deeply seated in the Bible. His stories were not communist stories. They were stories of faith. He knew this parable. And that's where the inspiration for the story I just told you came from. In the end, Tolstoy suggests that all a man really owns is a three by six piece of earth. So we're better off putting our confidence elsewhere. Jesus, like Tolstoy, is warning us that we're better off not trusting in pure materialism And if we do, we will wind up being sadly disappointed. Jesus might have asked, how much barn does a man need? We might ask today, how much storage space does a man need? Any of us uh, guilty of putting things in a storage container because we don't have enough space at home? Oh, there are only three sinners in the whole congregation. (laughs) Come on, you guys, fess up, fess up. The only resource that can possibly respond and address our deepest longing is God. It's God that will be our rock and our sanity and our security, not a mutual fund, not a storage space. 
When the doctor calls you one day and says you have cancer, it's God that will offer you peace and calm, which you so desperately seek. The man in the parable was a fool because he banked on fool barns. Let us, as the people of God, store our money, as St. Jerome said, in the stomachs of the hungry, in the minds of the uneducated, in the bodies of the sick, in the spirits of the oppressed, and spread the gospel. Then, as Jerome suggests, we will be truly rich in God's eyes. Well, let's move on to the second point, and that is, he overestimated his own value. The man was a fool because he overestimated his own value in the worldly scheme of things. Listen to how he talked. I will store my grain. I will build bigger barns. I will say to myself, and so it goes. In four short verses, the rich man uses either the word I or my ten times. I or my. Me, 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 me. So he overestimates his own value. His error was not that he was a wealthy man. His foolishness lay in the superficiality and egotism which he displayed. I once read where a PhD in agriculture said that in his estimate, nature provides 95% of the energy necessary to produce a crop, while the farmer provides 5%. Yet in this story, a narcissistic farmer is using the words I and mine as though he's the only one involved in the growing process. You notice that? In the movie Shenandoah, Jimmy Stewart plays a Virginia farmer during the Civil War. He begins every meal with his family gathered around the table. Lord, I planted the seeds. I plowed the ground. I gathered in the harvest. And if I hadn't put the food on the table, it wouldn't be there. But we thank you anyway. (laughs) We're a little too much like the character that Jimmy Stewart played. We think it's really us who has done it all. We had all better understand the role of grace and mystery in the life that we live, or we too might fall prey to the sin of thinking too highly of ourselves. Beware of the self-proclaimed, self-made man. I've always had uh, some interesting conversations and disputes with people who've done a lot in their life and earned the way, and yet they've become sometimes a little blind to the help they've received, the doors that have been opened, the reliance on what others have done as well. The third point is that the uh, rich farmer forgot his business in life, his real business. The man was a fool because he forgot what it was all really for and all really about. This man thought that his business was about commodities and markets and accumulating things, and Jesus thought in deeper terms. Jesus is suggesting to us to to us that our business in life goes far beyond any tally sheet, any investment, any tax form. Our real business is that of our humanity. It gets down to the old philosophical tension between becoming and being. It gets down to whether we spend too much of our time concentrating on what we are coming, becoming and lose sight of what we are being in the meantime. There's a wonderful movie, I have not included it in our film series, but it certainly warrants being considered. Uh, It starred John Hurt, it was called The Doctor. It was based on a book by a physician called A Taste of My Own Medicine. And he was talking about being a doctor who dispensed treatment and had the roles turned around where he then became the patient and he began to see things differently. This particular doctor was very businesslike, rather glib, a good surgeon, but absolutely had no bedside manner, no rapport with his patients. One day, he and his office had in his office a Hispanic farmer who gathered with him, the man, and his family. 
The doctor had run some tests on the man and had discovered he was very seriously ill. In a very matter-of-fact way, the doctor said to the man, Sir, if I were you, I would get my affairs in order. At that, the Hispanic farmer placed one arm around his wife and his other arm around his children. And he said very simply, but very profoundly, Sir, my affairs are in order. You see the difference? He wasn't thinking about arrangements and possessions and what am I to do. He was thinking about what's of value to him and what he lives for. And that's his family. His affairs were in order. The last part has to do with time. The man was foolish because he thought only in earthly terms about time here and now. He didn't think about what comes after that, eternal time. His whole attitude was that life and the time in it was somehow unlimited. You know, the digital watch, which we didn't used to use, I, I have a, one with an actual dial and actual numbers on it. Uh, my kids began to use digital watches, and we ask ourselves, could they really tell time, those kids who saw the readouts? You say it's seven minutes till 10, and the kids with the digital watches may not have a slightest idea about what you're talking about. To them, it's 9.53. But because their digital watch tells them. So what the, is the problem with that? Simply this. Time should have a sweep to it. If we learn to see 9.53, then we see in the context of the immediate moment, not in the larger context of time. In fact, those who've been in the military know that there's a 24-hour period in military time. So you're even looking at time differently there. From our faith and experience, we learn two lessons about time. First, it's absolutely lethal for Christians to see only time as only right now. That's how the world looks at time. The Christians should learn that time is moving toward something, something beyond the right now. We believe in a life beyond this one. We are moving toward that time when we'll stand in the presence of God. That film, Left Behind, the first in our series, deals with that issue very profoundly. What happens next? And we'll see that in a pretty powerful way. How many people have all spent all the time in their life preparing to live, but haven't gotten down to living? The Hispanic farmer who came to the doctor's office was living out his life with his family, embracing them, cherishing them. The doctor, who was successful and prosperous and well-known in his field, wasn't living his life. He was preparing by grabbing as much as he could. And when he became sick, he learned how to live. Well, enough of the rich fool. What about those who are living with God in mind? In closing, here's a pop quiz. What do all of the following people have in common? Charles Welch of Welch's Grape Juice. J.C. Kraft of the Kraft's Cheese Corporation. Henry Crowell of Quaker Oats. William Colgate of Colgate Soap. Wallace Johnson, the founder of the Holiday Inns. J.C. Penney, the founder of the Penny Stores. Albert Hyde, who invented mentholatum and R.G. Letourneau of Letourneau College of Engineering. Anybody want to guess? What do they all have in common? <laughs> to, uh, yeah, don't all speak at once. Uh, they're all dead, okay. <laughs> that wasn't what I was looking for. <laughs> The, uh, the clue, and this is one that Ralph taught me, uh, that last name I mentioned, I mentioned R.G. Letourneau. Letourneau 
caught the attention of the world around him. He became a very prosperous man because he gave enormous amounts of money to Christian causes beyond himself. He didn't tithe. He, I don't know what, he gave like 50% of his income away. All of these people set aside things for God. They lived not for themselves, but for the betterment of others. Conrad Presby's was a name not known except in uh, giving circles, circles of large uh, donors in the San Diego area. His uh, uh, obituary was in the San Diego newspaper a week ago, uh, Monday. And Presby's uh, came to the San Diego area in 1980, 1963. He had $500, no job, no resources. He had worked in the steel industry and had a small pizza business uh, somewhere in Pennsylvania or wherever he was from. Presby's, as he became successful as a real estate uh, uh, person who was very shrewd and invested in property and, and houses and so on, began to look uh, early in his success. He began to look for worthy causes to give his money to gave $100 million to the Scripps Medical Institute, and he gave uh, uh, 50 or $100 million to the Arts Council in San Diego. He was always looking for something to give his money to. So my question to you is he was uh, a guy with a lot of barns. He lived, by the way, rather simply, but what did he do? He was thinking not about himself. He was thinking about the world around him. And uh, people spoke just uh, with amazing appreciation for his generosity. So he's an example, like this list that we looked at, of people who were not simply thinking about themselves. The answer to the pop quiz is all of these put God first in their life and business. They started their business asking God for wisdom and running it according to Christian principles. They gave him a tithe and graduated to proportionate giving from 25, from 15 to 25% of their profits. And as I said, Letourneau gave 50% of his money away. So are we living to accumulate, acquire, to hang on to, or are we living for something beyond that? And Jesus' answer to us very simply is, life does not consist in our possessions. It consists in who we are and what we share with one another. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for what Jesus taught us here from this passage in Luke 12. We thank you for those who've been good examples, as well as those who give us cause to pause and wonder. We ask your blessing as we continue to share our lives with others, and we certainly hope that at this point in our lives we are living and not simply preparing to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.